Hey everybody, so I want to go over the uh, the workshop that we did on Friday because it's a little bit uh, complicated as many of you saw and some of the concepts behind polar coordinates are a little bit difficult to interpret. I, I think it's, um, at first anyway, it's a lot harder to work with than Cartesian coordinates. Um, it gets a, <laughs> it got a little long on me. It's a snow day and I don't have a whole lot <laughs> else to do but uh, bear with me if you want to if, you, if you're sketchy on that problem, I'll try to help you out a bit. Um, so we, we look at it, and there's, of course, a, uh, this rod, and it's pushing this cylinder off to the right. And the rod moves, uh, it rotates clockwise at a steady rate. So you can imagine as it rotates clockwise, this angle uh, will accelerate off to the right. So the particle starts out at some slow rate, and it really shoots out to the right is this angle. Uh, uh, decreases and uh, so I've, I've got a cold as well so if I you can't understand me that's that's why but we look at this thing and the questions asking you uh, at the instant you know it's at 60 degrees what is the force of the rod on the cylinder and uh, if you knew the force of the rod on the cylinder you could find the torque at the base of the rod when theta equals 60 degrees and this this is because the rod acts normal to the cylinder and if you just multiply this length right here with the force on it you get the torque so once we figure out a and c you can go back and solve for b pretty easily and then uh, b what is the normal force of the surface on the particle and i give you a bunch of trig identities because some of the uh, calculus gets a little tricky. So the first thing to do in any problem, of course, is to draw a free body diagram. And I saw a lot of you were doing a really nice job with this. You identified the fact that there's uh, three forces acting on it. This contact force between the rod and the particle, gravity, and then the normal force pushing up on it. So with the free body diagram in mind, we need to calculate the components of all three of these. So here's the, so the second step, I should say, is to draw um, both the radial and the tangential components of motion. If this was in uh, Cartesian coordinates, we'd identify both the x and the y direction. So two dimensions, uh, look for two components of motion, in this case r and theta. So we look at it, and the uh, sum of forces in the radial direction is equal to the mass times the radial acceleration. So we identify in the uh, radial direction, there's some component of the normal force and some component of the weight. So you do run your uh, trigonometry on it for both the weight and the normal force in the theta direction. We can come up with an expression that relates the two forces with the acceleration. And I'll show you later on how to solve for the acceleration. So we've got the uh, equation of motion in the normal direction, or in the... Uh, the radial direction. So once we find the acceleration later on we can solve for n and this n is actually the magnitude of the normal vector. So the normal vector has got of course two different components and it looks a little bit weird at first because we've got a radial component and a theta component. When we go back the normal force it always acts in the vertical direction. So we're looking at this vector right here. So it always acts in the, the vertical direction. It just seems weird that we've got two different components. So if this was Cartesian coordinates, we'd expect the um, we'd expect it to to only be in the y direction. But here we've got a couple of components. I'll go over that later on. But work the geometry of this. There's five newtons acting in the radial direction, and again the radial direction is in this direction. So if we looked at it, um, if I move this over here, so there's a component of the normal force acting in the radial direction and there's a component acting in the theta direction, three newtons in the theta direction. So if I do this we've got, um, so it would line up like this in the positive theta direction. So this normal, this vector right here would be a little bit shorter. But the sum of these two components would put us uh, in a vertical orientation. So the transverse, after you do the radial uh, equation of motion. Run the equations for the transverse um, equation of motion. So the sum of forces in the theta direction, of course, is equal to m a theta. And the force of the rod is only acting in the theta direction. And it's really important to understand that. If we went back up, the force of the rod, just like the normal force had a component in the radial in the theta direction, the force of the rod, there is no component in the radial direction. There is no component in this direction. And 
it's always acting in the theta direction. Even when theta gets smaller because it's rotating to the right, you can imagine this arrow starts to point uh, more and more downward, but it only acts in the theta direction. So there is no trig behind the force on the rod. So run through the trigonometry, you can come up with a force on the rod is about negative 1.8 newtons. So that's the, the magnitude of it because there's only one component and here's the actual the vector in um, uh, polar coordinates. So again nothing in the r direction acts only in, in the direction of decreasing theta. So those are the equations of motion but I skipped ahead a little bit because we don't know yet the acceleration in the theta direction and we don't know yet the acceleration in the radial direction. So let's go work the geometry on this and figure out what those are. So to start with, we've got the particle, there's some um, direction in the, horiz the horizontal direction, and there's some radial component to it. And this radial, the distance we can, is h in this case. So we went back up, if I showed you back at the figure, we're going to, the geometry that we're working on is this triangle. So we want to figure out, you know, if we neglect the thickness of the rod, we want to work this geometry. We know the vertical, we know the um, opposite side to the angle is 0.5 meters. We want to figure out what the hypotenuse is for this right triangle. So we come back down, work the geometry, and you'll find that sine of theta is equal to h over r. You can solve for r is just h over sine theta, which is equal to h uh, times a cosecant of theta. And when you look at this, one way I, I always check my work is I test the limits of theta. So as theta went to zero, when the rod is all the way horizontal, it's been rotating for a little bit, and it's all the way horizontal, this radial distance will approach infinity. And rate at which r is changing, we just take the derivative of this. When we take the derivative of this, we get a function for r dot and r double dot. So the acceleration of the, uh, um, or the rate of change of this position vector r and the rate of uh, acceleration of this position r. So I'll talk about this later, but this does, doesn't necessarily mean that these are the components of the acceleration vector. So it's important to know that, but I'll elaborate on that in a second. And if we tested the limit uh, when theta goes to zero, we've got h over sine of zero, which is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the limit that theta is at 90 degrees, it's pointing straight up and down, we've just got r is equal to h. So that's just the uh, distance between um, the lower surface and where the particle is rotating. The, the height between the hinge and the surface over which the particle is rotating. One thing I want to uh, be sure that you know is we took the derivative of this function a couple of times, but don't forget, ever forget the chain rule. And formally, mathematically, what we really want to do is find the derivative of, for example, the uh, cosecant theta with respect to time. So it seems a little weird because you have to look at this and you, uh, all of you seem to be pretty good at it, but here's where it, it comes from mathematically. If we uh, multiply the uh, right hand side by d theta over d theta, this is just equal to 1, so we didn't do anything. But now to swap um, dt and d theta, we can now take the derivative of cosecant theta with respect to theta times d theta dt, which is simply theta dot. So don't ever forget the fact that we've got uh, theta dot over here. And d cosine cosecant theta d theta, you can look up in that trigonometric table. So running through the, the actual math on this, take the derivative of r. Don't forget the uh, product rule either in this case. You'll come up with a derivative for r. In this case, we get the product of three different terms. So take the derivative of this term in parentheses first, multiplied by theta dot, and then add that to this first term times the derivative of theta dot, which just leaves you at theta double dot. And it's important to recognize that the uh, shaft is rotating at a steady rate. So now plugging in numbers, we've got the uh, theta, the angle we're curious about is 60 degrees, the rate at which it rotates, negative 2 rads per second. And the, in terms of degrees per second, I put it here just to give you a, a feel for it, but it's, it's rotating over 90 degrees a second. So it's rotating, you know, it would go around, uh, the uh, bar would go around a complete circle in, in less than 4 seconds. So the, uh, it's rotating a steady rate, theta double dot, equal to zero. So if we evaluate this at theta equals 60 degrees, we've got a value for theta, we've got a value for theta dot, and you know, theta double dot, zero, this whole right-hand term falls out. Plug in numbers for this, and we'll have values for r, r dot, and r double dot. 
And the reason we care about all of this is to simply find the acceleration in the radial and in the transverse directions. Once you run the numbers on this, you'll get um, components again in the radial and theta direction. This acceleration, this is these are the two components of it, and the acceleration vector is in the horizontal direction. So if you envision it, the particle, it, it can only accelerate in the horizontal direction. If I went back up real fast to here, the particle, it's constrained by the horizontal surface. So there's no way it can move in the vertical direction. Only can accelerate in the horizontal direction. And I'm saying horizontal direction. I'm not saying x direction. I'm not saying theta or r direction. But keep in mind that we've got a horizontal and vertical direction. And we define those independent of the type of coordinate system that we use. So, so bear that in mind. What makes polar coordinates a little bit weird is the fact we've got this acceleration vector in the horizontal direction going to the right. And there are two components to this. So if we do the, the two components of the vector, there will be one component in this direction, in the transverse direction, and one component of acceleration in the radial direction. So this is a right triangle. When theta decreases, when this angle gets smaller and smaller, the bar's moving to the right, the rod's moving to the right. What this means is that the acceleration vector is more, it begins to point more and more in the radial direction, simply because this, these axes begin to rotate to the right. So keep that in mind. I'll show you more specifically uh, in a second. So again, the acceleration vector, these are evaluated. It only applies for theta equal to 60 degrees. If theta, when theta is decreasing, when it hits 15 degrees, for example, you'd expect a, a much larger component in the radial direction than in the transverse direction. So these numbers change, whereas in uh, Cartesian or rectangular coordinates, they don't. If we were just talking about the x and the y vector, they're there would never be a component in the y direction. It would just be in that x direction. The uh, If the particle was accelerating at a steady rate, then that component in the x direction would, would be steady. What's, uh, let me go back. What's weird about this is we just said theta double dot is equal to zero, which it is because the bar is rotating at a steady rate. But here we are saying that the acceleration vector in the theta component is not equal to zero. So that seems a little bit weird to go back uh, explain a little bit more in a second. But I made a couple of graphs to to hopefully show you what, what's going on. So I made a graph of theta as a function of time. And I just uh, assumed at time zero the uh, rod is pointing straight up and down. And here in less than, the, less than a second, theta has rotated all the way to an angle that's almost equal to zero. And again, it's rotating at a steady rate, so we just see this linear trend. So this is... Uh, uh, just rotating steadily clockwise. And solving for r like we did before and plugging in theta as a function of time, we get this functional relationship between the radius or the distance between the hinge to the particle in meters as a function of time. And you can see with, you know, we start out at time zero when theta is 90 degrees, we start out at half a meter. And when it begins to rotate, it quickly it really quickly begins to approach an infinite value. So once, uh, after a significant amount of time elapse, or not even significant, a short amount of time elapse, the uh, radial distance between the particle and the hinge um, approaches infinity. So this is, you can read this when I post the notes, but it's a comment on, uh, I'm discussing the difference between the uh, theta double dot in terms of the position vector and the um, uh, theta component of acceleration. So I'll let you read through that on your own if you're interested in this or if you're confused as to why theta dot equals zero um, but the acceleration vector um, it does have a component in the theta direction. So I think you know, to many of you it seems conflicting at first if you're not used to working with polar coordinates because we just said that theta double dots equal to zero. So look through this and I show you this graphically down below. So what we've got in this diagram, theta, this is the theta direction. It's defining um, the transverse or theta direction. The r direction is in this location. Here's the location of the particle relative to the origin for our polar coordinates. So we'll set that at the hinge just for convenience. The acceleration vector, again, it always must be in the horizontal direction. So we define two components again, radial and theta co components, to get this horizontal um, acceleration vector. 
you know, if we look at it, it, it may be easier to see if you look at a few examples. So here I've got um, theta, the first example I, I did, theta equals 60 degrees, which is the uh, location where we're looking for in this problem. The um, radial component to the acceleration is this blue vector on the left, and the transverse component is acting in the negative theta direction. And it always, remember, uh, yeah, so in this case it's a negative theta direction. So compare when theta goes from 60 to 45 to 15, what happens is that the transverse component to the acceleration gets smaller and smaller over time, and the radial component gets larger and larger. So once theta is equal to zero, the acceleration vector is completely in the radial direction. And conversely, when theta is equal to 90 degrees, this vector would be pointing straight up and down, and it would all be in the transverse direction, all 90 degrees at a right angle to the position vector. So I hope this clears up some of the things that I, that I uh, personally find a little bit confusing with this problem at first, before you've worked with it quite a bit. But uh, anyway, feel free to use this, uh, this video and these notes to, to complete your workshop. And uh, as always, drop me an email if anything seems uh, confusing. Take care.